All right, this begins our lecture video regarding the muscular system, looking at the cellular level of muscle physiology. So there's two receptors that are tied in with the nervous system. These are sensory receptors that provide information about muscle and joints and brings that into the brain for processing. So in in order for muscles to contract in a smooth, coordinated manner, we need this constant sensory input from proprioceptors that are part of the nervous system, part of the sensory pathway of the nervous system. So recall from our discussion in the nervous system that proprioceptors are receptors that indicate something about body position. So we have information coming from two specific proprioceptors. We have the muscle spindles, which are found in the belly of muscles, particularly the long muscles of the limbs, and then the Golgi tendon organ, which is embedded in the tendons at joints. So both of these are proprioceptors that provide information to the brain for regarding body position. And then the response from the brain, that motor response, is going to adjust muscle contraction to keep the body moving in the way that is intended. For example, if a person is standing, it'll keep the muscles contracting that keep the body in a standing position. So let's talk about our first proprioceptor, which is called the muscle spindle. This is a special structure that we find embedded in the belly of muscles. So here in the widened portion of the muscle, we have these special fibers that make up the muscle spindle. And those fibers consist of three to 10 thin filaments, thin muscle fibers, that have a neuron wrapped around them that brings sensory information to the spinal cord and the brain when they change in length or also some of these fibers will tell us how fast they're changing in length. So the muscle spindle, when it's stretched, sends information to the brain and spinal cord about the position or the stretch of that muscle. So these fibers that make up the mu muscle spindle, they are muscle fibers and they contract only at their ends. They don't contract in the middle, but they do contract at the ends. But these are called intrafusal fibers. They're inside the belly of the muscle. They're wrapped around a special connective tissue sheath here, you can see. And they, have, they are a, a proprioceptor, bringing sensory information in about the length of that muscle or the degree of stretch. So, these are called intrafusal fibers, these purple and green fibers. The normal muscle fibers that contract and contribute to muscle con, you know, activity, these are called extrafusal fibers. So these are the ones that we've already talked about that contract when a nerve stimulates them to do that. So they're part of the somatic nervous system. They're the effector organ, right, of the somatic nervous system. So when we look at these fibers then, and we look at the neurons that stimulate them, there's two neurons that you need to pay attention to. We have the neuron that comes, it's a motor neuron, a neuron that goes strictly to the intrafusal fibers, to the muscle spindle. This is called the gamma neuron. So the gamma neuron only feeds the muscle spindle. And then the alpha motor neuron, if we look at th this particular neuron, this one feeds the extrafusal fibers. So we have the extrafusal fibers feeding the alpha motor neuron and the, intra, uh, the gamma motor neuron serving the intrafusal fibers. So we have the alpha motor neuron, gamma motor neuron, each feeding different fibers. So when we passively stretch our muscle, that stretches the muscle spindle and that will send an impulse, an action potential, to the spinal cord for processing. And then the response from that contraction is to come back to the muscle and contract. So we see the gamma motor neuron contracts the muscle spindle only at the ends, and the alpha motor neuron will stimulate the whole muscle to contract at the same time. So we find that the muscle spindle stays the same length as the actual muscle fiber itself. So these, when the muscle, when the extrafusal fiber, fibers contract, that is also going to cause a contraction within the spindles, the intrafusal fibers. So we call that alpha-gamma coactivation. 
And basically, that just maintains the sensitivity of the spindle by making sure that when the whole muscle is contracting, that the interfusal fibers of the muscle spindle are also contracting. And that information, again, the length of that spindle is constantly being sent via this sensory neuron to the spinal cord and brain for input about position of that muscle. So as muscles contract, as we know, the bones will move, and that is information about body position. So this muscle spindle is necessary for proper positioning of the muscles by the brain. So that motor response depends on the sensory input from these neurons that are in the muscle spindle. So when you think of the muscle spindle as a proprioceptor, receptor, it's measuring the length of the muscle, or another way of thinking it, it's the degree of stretch. So length, the more stretched it is, the longer it is, the less stretched, the shorter it is. So muscle spindle starts with an S and we can say it's dealing with stretch and how fast it's stretching or speed of stretch. So our other organ, our other proprioceptor, is the Golgi tendon organ. And this is a, a sensory neuron as well and the fibers, the axon, or the, I'm sorry, there's the sensory receptors of the Golgi tendon are embedded in the tendon where this muscle attaches to bone. And this sends information to the brain for processing regarding the tension or the pull, the, the amount of force acting on that tendon. So when you think of tendon, think tension. The amount of tension in that tendon is being uh, perceived and um, that sensory information is sent to the sp spinal cord and brain for processing. So this also gives information about tension, or uh, about position, I should say, specifically tension. But if we compare these two proprioceptors, the, the muscle spindle information that is sent to the brain and spinal cord is unconscious. We are not aware of the degree of stretch in the muscle spindle. So that is something for subconscious proprioception. However, the Golgi tendon is something that we are consciously aware of, so we can tell how much tension is in our tendons, and we know that when there's greater tension, um, that can put more force on the muscle, so we have to be careful um, that we don't overstretch our tendons. Uh, I shouldn't say overstretch, um, but we should challenge them too much because we know tendons can tear away from bone if they're not properly conditioned. So we take advantage of this extra tension. We know the greater the tension, the more uh, contraction that we can, the greater the stretch, the more um, contraction we can get, increased action potentials as there's greater stretch. So for example, when we uh, bend down before a run, we know that extra tension, that extra pull on the muscle can result in greater force when running. So if you look at runners, for example, at the start line, of a, a track meet, you'll notice that they, they crouch down and that extra crouching puts a little more pressure on that Golgi tendon as well as stretches the muscle spindle and, we can re and that will cause an increase in the number of action potentials and give you a greater force of contraction. So the Golgi tendon and the muscle spindle are both important sensory receptors that allow for coordinated muscle movements where we have smooth uh, awareness of in some cases, um, of our muscle or body position. Again, the muscle spindle is unconscious proprioception, and the Golgi tendon we are consciously aware of. So you can demonstrate this by closing your eyes and putting your arms out to your side and then bringing your fingertips together. And you'll notice that you can get pretty close in touching the fingertips together with your eyes closed. And that's because of proprioceptive information that's being provided through proprioceptors in muscles and joints. So when we look at muscle, another contributor to how well we can coordinate our muscles and their activity is based on the concept of motor units. So motor units are where the, the motor neuron, that lower motor neuron we talked about in the nervous system, how that lower motor neuron innervates muscle cells in a particular muscle. So the definition is a motor neuron and the, all the fibers that it supplies. So we can see one motor neuron um, that will serve a muscle, provide action potentials to a muscle via the neuromuscular junction, but those axon terminals of that motor neuron can branch into several different muscle fibers. 
So here's one motor unit shown in purple. We can see that, that lower motor neuron. Remember, it originates in the ventral horn of the spinal cord, exits the ventral root, and comes out here in the axon terminals branch on individual muscle fibers. So motor unit two is another motor unit serving the same muscle. And again, it also branches serving several different muscle fibers. And each of these axon terminals, one little bulb of the axon terminal forms a neuromuscular junction where we see calcium and acetylcholine is released and it binds to the motor end plant of this muscle cell and causes contraction of each of those individual myofibrils. So that's a review of some of the physiology you should have learned in general A&P. So we have these motor units, and the, the larger the muscle, the more motor units are in that muscle. So for example, um, if we look, and even within a motor unit, we can have a, a, a varying number of motor fi or muscle fibers. For example, uh, a motor unit of the muscles that open and close the eyelids, we, those motor units would have very few muscle fibers. Or where if we look at the quadriceps muscle, which is found on the front of the thigh, those motor units would contain several hundred muscle fibers. So the more fibers, the stronger the movement or the larger force that those motor units can generate. And unfortunately, though, the more fibers we have making up a motor unit, and the more motor units we recruit, the less precise that movement's going to be. So we use our large muscle for for activities such as you know, kicking a football or kicking a soccer ball. And precise movements involve motor units with fewer fibers per unit. For example, our fingers and eyes have uh, fewer muscle fibers and our fingers can control a pen and, and perform very precise movements like surgery because there's fewer of these muscle fibers in that motor unit. So when we look at muscle strength then, it depends on the number of motor units that are recruited. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the specific um, concept related to contractile force a little bit later in this discussion. So before we get too much into that, I do want to talk about where energy for contraction comes from. So when we look at the muscle metabolism, we go back to just general metabolism, reviewing the concepts of glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, and lactic acid fermentation. So we already discussed those topics, and if you're not familiar with those, you might want to go back into our earlier learning modules and review those topics. So essentially, when we start muscle contraction, the first source of energy for muscle contraction is going to come from ATP that's available in the muscle. So that's the first place to go for this energy because we know the phosphate from ATP is used as a direct source of energy from, um, for the myosin head to perform the power stroke and bind to actin and cause, myo, and cause muscle contraction in the myofilaments. So ATP is the first place to go for that energy. But again, it's very short-lived. Within four to six seconds of muscle contraction, the ATP stores are depleted. So there's another special molecule, and it's called creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate, um, it, there's five times more creatine phosphate than um, stored ATP. So this is readily available once ATP runs out. And it's a pretty quick process to get this creatine phosphate ready to provide energy because creatine phosphate provides the phosphate for the ADP that's formed when ATP is broken down. And that provides the phosphate to make more ATP and, again, provide energy for muscle contraction at the myosin head. So creatine phosphate is a rich source of energy in muscle cells. But unfortunately, um, it's very short-lived. This is a very quick reaction. It requires a, an enzyme called creatine kinase, and that's just one step. So we get a quick conversion of creatine phosphate to creatine. We release that phosphate and put it on ATP, and then we have a direct um, production of energy. So this is very good for activities that last less than a minute. So for weightlifters or um, people that are doing very, very short bursts of energy, the ATP and creatine phosphate can be a source of, of energy and 
but again, it's very short-lived. So um, 15 seconds is what we say is typical, but together with the stored ATP, it could be as high as a minute. It depends on the textbook resource you go to, but again, very short-lived. And it's important that you know just the order of of the go-to molecules that we see for energy production in muscle. So the first is stored ATP. Then we have creatine phosphate. So creatine phosphate sometimes is a in the form of a powder that um, muscle or bodybuilders will drink to um, increase the force of contraction for, for weightlifting competition. So it is useful for that. But any exercise lasting you know, more than 30 seconds or more, it's pretty much useless because the creatine phosphate, is this reaction is reversible. So as soon as that activity is done, the body restores the creatine phosphate again and it's readily available for muscle contraction. So it's one of those kind of pay-as-you-go type of reactions in the sense that it's constantly providing ATP throughout the muscle contraction as long as um, there's other sources of energy available which we'll talk about next. So once the, the ATP is gone, once the creatine phosphate has been used, then the next pathway is the anaerobic pathway and that includes glycolysis. So glycolysis is the production of pyruvic acid. So we take glucose and produce pyruvic acid. Remember that we get two molecules of pyruvic acid for every glucose. So where this glucose comes from would be uh, blood glucose or stored glycogen that's broken down into glucose within the muscle cell. So this glucose is broken down via glycolysis, but because muscles are contracting at a maximal level, that can sometimes impair blood flow to the muscle, not providing enough oxygen. So as a result of that, that pyruvic acid does not enter the mitochondria and begin the Krebs cycle, but rather it is converted into lactic acid. So we only get a small amount of ATP. If you recall, glycolysis only produces a net of two ATP. So it's good, again, for short-term exercise but not much beyond that because we just don't produce enough ATP to continue. And that lactic acid that's produced will diffuse back into the bloodstream. It's used, it can be converted um, by the liver back to pyruvic acid, and then it could be readily available for the aerobic pathway if there's oxygen available. So the anaerobic pathway, again, we can see that the glucose comes from either glycogen or uh, if it's in the blood, say a person ate breakfast that morning and they have some glucose circulating in the blood, um, that glucose is broken down by glycolysis into pyruvic acid, and then that pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid, and we get a net gain of 2 ATP. So this is the anaerobic pathway. So far, oxygen is not necessary for this, this amount of energy. And again, this is short-term energy, so we're not going um, the distance quite yet. We're just um, doing short-term exercise, like a 100-meter um, dash, for example. So if we need to go longer than, you know, 30 seconds to a minute of exercise, then we need to go the aerobic pathway. But if you recall from when we studied the um, metabolism, we know that there are many enzymes involved and many steps involved in the Krebs cycle. So that takes time for that process to, to, to complete and to get our ATP necessary and the precursors necessary for the electron transport chain where we see a lot more ATP production, which we said was around 28 molecules of ATP up to 32 per glucose. So this process takes time. So when we look at longer events, longer than a, few, a minute, then we're going the aerobic pathway. So if we look at the, the nutrient source for the aerobic pathway, once we've used up the stored glycogen and the glucose in the blood, then the preferred uh, nutrient are free fatty acids. So that's where if you look at a, a, a machine, at the local health club, you'll see there's a fat burning zone. And that's when we enter into that zone when we're not overtaxing our muscles, but we are you know, uh, efficiently using the aerobic pathway to produce ATP and free fatty acids are the source of energy for making that ATP.
So that is the aerobic pathway. And that's where most of the energy comes when we are breathing well, oxygen delivery to the muscles is maximized, and we're just participating in mild exercise. So the key to the aerobic pathway is time. We need time for these steps of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which both occur in the mitochondria with the help of oxygen. It just takes time for those reactions to occur. Because the anaerobic pathway um, only converts about 5% of the energy um, of ATP compared to aerobic to compare to the aerobic pathway. So we get a lot more energy from the aerobic pathway, 95%, like I said, um, of the ATP per glucose is through the aerobic pathway. Only 5% of um, the aerobic path or the energy of the aerobic pathway is available using the anaerobic pathway of glycolysis, lactic acid fermentation. But the benefit, again, of lactic acid fermentation and glycolysis is that it's faster. It's two and a half times faster than the aerobic pathway. So if we look at the uh, exercise um, duration and the steps used you know, to get energy, stored ATP happens in the first few seconds, and then creatine phosphate. And then once those stores are used up, then glycogen in muscle and blood is used via glycolysis. And then from that point onward, we have to rely on the aerobic pathway, which is the Krebs cycle electron transport chain, which requires oxygen. So we can see that the aerobic pathway is slow to start, but it definitely endures and takes us the distance as long as oxygen is available. So what stops the process of contraction when someone is competing, say, in a long-distance run or even a short-term exercise like a, a sprint? When we see imbalances of calcium, which is necessary for muscle contraction, remember it binds to troponin and releases the binding site for actinomyosin to interact, causing contraction. So if calcium is imbalanced due to muscle cell damage from extreme exercise, we see um, an inability for those muscles to contract. And we see pain develop as lactic acid builds up within the muscle cell, and we see pH drops. So with extreme exercise, we can see pH imbalances because of lactic acid releasing hydrogen ion, dropping blood pH. So it's not common, however, that we see a lack of ATP, but it rarely occurs when we don't have any more ATP production. Most of the time we see imbalances in the ions necessary for muscle contraction. That's why it's important when we do long distance exercise that we replace those electro electrolytes that are lost. So we know that sodium um, enters the cell in muscle in the, at the neuromuscular junction and potassium leaves the cell. Well, we can lose uh, sodium from our extracellular fluid through intense sweating. So people that exercise on a very hot day need to replace that sodium. And the loss of potassium during the action potentials of muscle cell can result in low potassium inside cells. So it's important that we replenish our muscles with potassium as well. Sometimes low potassium after exercise can cause muscle cramping, and it's important that we replace that and, and get a good, a good amount of potassium in our diet because it's very important for muscle contraction, as is sodium. So when we are done exercising, say it's a short burst of energy and we rely only on stored ATP, creatine phosphate, and glycolysis, we're left short um, with the ATP needed um, to continue muscle activity. So what happens is the excess lactic acid that results from these activities can be converted back to glucose or glycogen, but it requires oxygen to do that. So we call it the oxygen deficit. It's the difference between the amount of oxygen that we use during that early activity compared to the amount of oxygen needed to restore and get everything back to normal. And that requires 
oxygen after exercise. So that's the heavy breathing we see, say, when you run up the steps, maybe to class, and you find yourself breathing heavily at the end. You're basically repaying your oxygen debt. So that's the oxygen needed to convert that lactic acid back to glucose and even glycogen by the liver if it's going to be stored. So we want to replenish the creatine phosphate. We want to remove lactic acid and partially um, regenerate some of those glycogen stores. All of that requires oxygen. So that's what we call the oxygen deficit. Your textbook calls it, it's a newer term, it's called excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. That's just basically, again, the heavy breathing we see after exercise. And it is important, and it's a good sign of um, our body, our homeostatic mechanisms are in place. So when a person is engaging in heavy breathing after an intense activity, that's important that they, you know, breathe well and, and allow for that oxygenation to convert things back to normal after intense exercise. So as a result of this energy production, some of that energy is not useful for actually phosphorylating and creating muscle contraction. Some of it's given off as heat, and 60% of the energy in this process is given off as heat. So that's about the same as a typical machine, so it's not an inefficient process. And we know that heat is given off in two ways. Some of it is given off um, when we sweat, and during the evaporation process, and some of it comes from the radiation of heat through dilated blood vessels serving the skin. So those are two ways that we get rid of that excess heat. Because as we know, if those mechanisms are not in place and we're not able to get rid of the heat, we can um, overheat and that can lead to heat stroke and death. So this, it's important that those mechanisms are in place to get rid of the excess heat during muscle, increased muscle activity. So going back to how muscles contract, there's a number of factors that determine how much force we can get from a muscle. And we already talked about motor units. And motor units, remember, are made up of a motor neuron and the muscle fibers it um, innervates or supplies. So the more muscle fibers that we activate, the larger the force of contraction. And the larger those muscle cells are, the, more, the larger the muscle contraction. So if we have a larger diameter muscle fiber, that's going to generate more force because there's more myofilaments contracting in a larger muscle fiber. And then if we increase the frequency of stimulation, remember we talked about in the nervous system, in order to get an increased um, strength of stimulus, that requires a higher frequency of action potentials. So the greater frequency of action potentials stimulating a motor neuron, the more force it's going to generate because the muscle isn't allowed to completely relax. And if we take that muscle fiber and stretch it slightly beyond its resting length, we get a stronger muscle contraction because those uh, myosin heads are more engaged, we have more myosin heads to engage that actin myofilament, and we see a larger amount of area of the um, muscle fiber that can act actually engage in cross bridging and contraction. So these are the four variables that will increase contractile force. So if we look at the speed and length of contraction, as far as how fast a muscle can contract, and how long it can contract, it depends on the fiber type, depends on the opposing force. So for example, if we're looking at how fast I can pick up a pen and how, I can, how long I can hold that pen, that would be a lot longer than lifting up, say, a 100 pound weight. So obviously the opposing force or the load is gonna determine you know, how fast and how long that muscle can contract with that load. And then recruitment, we already talked about, when I can recruit more motor units within a muscle, I'm going to get a stronger contraction. It's almost like if you think of a, a tug of war. The more people you add to one side of the rope, the more force you can generate in that direction. So with muscle recruitment, we're talking about recruiting more motor units to that activity. So let's talk about muscle fiber type. When we look at the different types of muscle cells that make up a muscle, there's two major types, and then there's an intermediate type here that I'm not going to go into detail on. We're going to talk about the two extreme opposites. So there's slow twitch fibers. We call them slow twitch and fast twitch. 
Um, your textbook table here calls them slow oxidative and fast glycolytic. So basically what that means is slow oxidative fibers are muscle fibers that are slow to contract because they have the ATPase activity that acts on the myosin head is a slower reaction, a slower process. However, it is a um, less resistant to fatigue because it's that slower process. It holds the contraction and it's the first to be recruited, but it's the last to get engaged in the process because of that slow myosin ATPase activity. It has a high amount of myoglobin. Myoglobin is a special protein we see in muscle cells that binds oxygen and iron. So that provides extra oxygen for muscle activity. So because of that extra oxygen holding ability, this is, um, has a high ability for um, aerobic activity. So when we are engaging in long distance endurance exercises that don't need a, a, a very large amount of strength of muscle contraction, we recruit the slow oxidative fibers. And m some people's muscles are, are a blend of both fibers. Most people's muscles are, but in, a, in certain athletes that are especially talented in long distance running, for example, we might find that they have a higher percentage of the slow oxidative fibers, which makes those muscles well suited for those endurance, long endurance activities. And if we look at these under a microscope, we'll see that these fibers are red in color because of the myoglobin content. It gives them a red appearance. They're smaller in diameter, so they're not good for strong muscular contractions. They have many mitochondria, so they're good for that aerobic pathway and creating lots of ATP for the long haul, for long endurance. And they also have many capillaries to supply the oxygen that these muscle cells do very well with. So with these, when you look at, for example, a chicken, you'll notice that the, um, the muscles of the leg and the thigh, which chickens are good at running and walking long distances, those are slow twitch fibers. They're darker in color, they have more blood vessels, and they are a little bit of a fattier meat because they're, they're geared toward long distance activities. The opposite are the fast glycolytic fibers. These split ATP on the myosin head very quickly, um, but they are fast to fatigue because of that. And they have a low myoglobin content, low glycogen stores, and they're the last to be recruited, but they kick in very quickly. So they're good for short-term, intense, powerful movements such as weightlifting, deadlifting, 100 meter dash, hitting a baseball. They're good for powerful, strong contractions because if we look at the diameter of these fast glycolytic fibers, they are large in diameter. But because they have a low myoglobin content, they are white in appearance and they have a lower amount of fat. So the breast of a chicken, you don't see flocks of chickens flying overhead because those muscles are not uh, suited for those long distance activities. They can do short bursts, but they tire very quickly. So we see fewer mitochondria and fewer capillaries in the fast glycolytic fibers. So this picture just shows the three different types of fibers. There's the intermediate fiber that we're not going to talk about. Those are the fast oxidative. But here you can see the slow oxidative, that would be like the dark meat and the fast glycolytic would be like the white meat. So we can see how our muscles are a mixture of these different types of fibers, but some, like I said, talented athletes might have a, a, a larger percentage of one type over another. For example, if someone is a, is a better than average distance runner, they might have more slow oxidative fibers. If someone is a better than average sprinter, they might have a higher percentage of fast glycolytic fibers.